Well, hello there. I'm Brennan Storr, host of the Ghost Story Guys podcast. And I am Joseph Camo, host of the Cardinal Rule and a few other miscellaneous YouTube channels. And this is Weird Together, where we talk about the latest and greatest in independent horror films. We're not critics. We're not experts. We're just weird together. Weird Together is part of the Ghost Story Guys family, which also includes the fantastic podcast, Mysteries and Monsters, Luke Lore, and Transmissions from the Void. Yes, sir. Available on podcast platforms everywhere. Joseph, my friend, how are you? I'm Your doing well. still bloody from this evening. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I had, had a little bit of an interesting day uh, uh, in, in the social media space, but I'm doing okay. Uh, I've had a good week overall. Things are going well. Semester's going well. You know, uh, you know, it's, it's better than a kick to the teeth, right? So uh, I'm, I'm doing pretty well. How about you? All right. I'm also good. Yeah, man. Uh, today was my, technically my day off. Oh, okay. I am disconnecting. My image is not going well. There we go. Okay. I have bad internet because apparently Quebec has bad internet. That's, that's what I'm being told. But uh, anyways, no, I'm good. And I'm really been excited because of course we just launched the Weird Together podcast. Mm -hmm. So now twice a month, you'll be able to get uh, shows from us. We'll have the live show at the end of every month. I believe it'll usually be the last Wednesday, if I'm not mistaken, of every month, 10 o'clock Eastern time, seven o'clock on the West coast. And then you can get it in audio, which will be, uh, basically two weeks after that. So we have one audio episode now at skin and And the other, we have audio versions of our live streams going back as far as I want to say Saloon. I don't think it is. I think uh, one, maybe one or two. Did we go all the way to Mad God? Allegory. Okay. Nope. That's Al yeah, we didn't. And Mad God's not there, but all the way back to Allegory, which I, I rewatched the other day. It still holds up. So nice. yes, so you can find all of that on podcast platforms everywhere. We'll put a link in, I guess we can't do show, show notes for this, but yeah, you'll find us on and on Megaphone, we're on Megaphone, possibly not for much longer, but we're also going to be on, we're on Spotify and, and all those places. So Joseph, as always, I'm excited to be back and here talking with, uh, talking to you about the brand new, I think it just came out a couple days ago, horror film, horror comedy, I guess, Mean Spirited. And Mean Spirited, of course, is a found footage, uh, found footage film directed by Jeff Ryan. And it is about the YouTuber, The Amazing Andy, who takes a road trip with his buddies to meet Bryce who is a friend of his who used to be his co-host and is now a giant star. And Andy is real pissed about that. So he is, he's decided to celebrate his 35,000th, I believe, subscriber by creating a vlogumentary. And we're going to talk about it. There's, there's a few things in here I want to bring up uh, once we, once we get down to it, but I will say everyone kind of shits on Andy and the fact that no one watches his show and he's got 35,000 subscribers and well, I mean, that's better than we're doing, so let's not reflect too much on how we spend our our, uh, our off hours, Joseph. Yes. Real quick, want to say hey to some of the folks that are hanging out with us. We have Rin yes, yes. Uh, Lemieux here with us in the chat. I'm so ready hey, to be weird together. We appreciate you being weird. And we've got Derek here with us. Greetings, gentlemen. Thank you for hanging hey, out Derek. with us. Appreciate you all being part of our regular crew. So, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in talking about this one, you know, because, you know, I do YouTube content and obviously that's what we're doing here. Um, and, and so, you know, I've got some maybe a few thoughts on on kind of that, that um type of channel and, and certain things about that. So that, that was an interesting theme to me, you know, based on, on something that, you know, I certainly spent a lot of time doing. Sure. All right. Well, of course we're going to talk about the film, but before you yeah. do that, you never watch a film in isolation. Every film you've ever watched goes in to the theater with you, or in this case, into the, uh, my, my, uh, tiny little dorm room here. And so before we break down the film, we've got to break down the baggage. <laughs> All right, Joseph, what, if any, baggage did you have going into Mean Spirited? Well, you know, as I mentioned, you know, doing YouTube content, I have certain opinions and thoughts and things I've learned about, mm -hmm. about the platform itself and the type of content that, that's on it. Um, so certainly I had some baggage going in in terms of my thoughts on that. And uh, as the film started uh, and I got a sense of who this guy was right from the beginning, I, you know, I'm like, the first thought I had while watching this was like, oh my God, prank YouTubers are the worst. <laughs> you know, like this film <laughs> has totally set up this character, Andy, to be a very unlikable character, at least for me. 
Um, you know, so certainly that was, uh, you know, probably the biggest piece of baggage. Any ideas I have about YouTube and, you know, my views on that type of content. Right. No, fair enough. For me, I think I had very little. I didn't know much about the film. Uh, I'll be totally honest. This was this was very much a last minute pick uh, because you sent me a message on I think it was Friday saying what are we what movie are we doing Wednesday? Mm -hmm. And I had only seen a couple uh, new horror films recently. I'd had usually kind of an unusually slow week, uh, just busy with lots of other work things. Yeah. And so it was it was this or a film I didn't really enjoy very much, and I, I did like this one. So I, again, I, but and all I knew about it really was that it was found footage and uh, that it was called mean spirited and i like found footage films that's i've kind of mentioned that on the show before i'm usually in the bag for those uh with some exceptions of course uh although the, I, the name put me off a little bit mm -hmm. mean spirited i there's a film called i think it's called for the sake of vicious mm. it's a really unpleasant film and so i i heard the name and i kind of thought hmm I, for some reason, I connected and I thought, I hope this is not going to be a really nasty film just because I, I'm not really, you know, I'm kind of a wimp that way. I don't really like yeah, very, very, you know, kind of tortury films. And of course it wasn't. So I didn't really have much baggage going into this one. I was just curious to see what was what was out, what was new. And of course, as you know, I'm a, why we do this. I love independent horror films. I love... I love supporting small uh, small creators who are on the way up because I think the big guys get enough of our they get enough of our energy anyways. They don't need my help to. Right. And so that was I think that was it. And okay. naturally, of course, there's only one place we can break down everything else, Joseph. Yes. I think you know what that is. I do. It's a Toctagon. Welcome to the Toctagon. Two men enter. Two men leave. All right. All right. Joseph, the talk yes. to gone. We are here. You've just finished fighting on Twitter. Now it's time to fight on YouTube like a man. <laughs> yes, it is. Why don't so you get let me, started? What, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, let me, let me, we're talking. See, we're already fighting and talking over each other. Uh, yeah. Um, let me start with something we were just talking about, though. Um, the, 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 the type, you, you mentioned the name mean spirited in that gave you a little bit of apprehension. Is this going to be, you know, a, a film that had a lot of, you know, can, well, <laughs> mean stuff. And, you know, and, and certainly the main character is a prank YouTuber, which to me is not a type of YouTube content. I like at all. Uh, it, it has I didn't even volume. know that was a thing. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, it's not as popular and uh, you know, it's, it's certainly harder to <laughs> like the, the ad revenue is lower for it because it's just, you know, advertisers aren't going to be as interested in it, but it has, right. it has an audience. Um, you know, to me, when I think about that type of content, one, I'm just not a fan of humor that is based on the non-fictitious suffering of others. If it's fictitious suffering, that's a whole different thing, but actually, you know, take, you know, making, taking advantage of people and, 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 and they just show little bits of the kinds of things he does, you know, at the beginning in the montage and interspersed when he's dropping the eggs on people and when he's giving the person the glass of toilet water, you know, and just, oh, yeah. and then it's just, yeah. It's so like, I just, I got, there is nothing about that kind of behavior or conduct or content that I like. And to me, it's, it's, you know, it's a little bit of that kind of content to me as a spiritual successor to uh, Tom green and then the jackass films. <laughs> and I, and I know oh, that ask your grandkids, man, Tom yeah, green. Right. I, and I'll tell you what, I mean, he, I know he was hugely popular, but I never liked the way he was like unrelentingly like mean to other people, like, you know, just, you know, made humor at the expense of other people. And I'm just not down with that. Right. And so prank YouTubers are kind of like that. Um, so, you know, it was, it was, I was glad that they didn't lean too much into that. They, they gave you glimpses of it to see who this guy was, but it wasn't constant. And, you know, so, so that, that at least, was nice uh, that they didn't go too far into that. Uh, you you know you mentioned though you know his thirty five thousand subscribers and it's interesting because there's a couple of thoughts on that I uh, I kind of want to note. You know like I my content that I do is for you know a football team uh, you know whatever and and for the for the kind of niche I'm in that would be a very big channel, but for the sure. kind of niche that 
Andy is supposed to be in. That's that is a that is not a huge channel. That's a oh okay. That, that's you know like that's a channel that's not insignificant. That it's had enough you know growth, but channels in that niche you know that are successful or in those types of niches, you're talking hundreds of thousands, if not pushing millions of subscribers. Um, right. Yeah, the big dogs. I mean, there's for every for every you know. Uh, million subscriber channel there's thousands of channels that uh have like you know 50 subscribers so he was like kind of in that almost aspirational class of content creators for his stuff right for what he does big right. enough which that i guess he then the sort of leads to, makes the end of the film make 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 a lot more well not not that it didn't make sense but it leads to the end of the film because he is that aspirational person which is why he's yeah. chosen Right. And just the, the final note I'd mention on that is there's the point where there's a point that I thought was interesting to me that just stuck out to me where he's in the car and he gets this thing on his phone, looks at his phone and sees he got one new subscriber. He's an excite and he's excited about that. And so the, the one of two things with that, like a channel that size that if it's growing is probably getting dozens, if not hundreds of new subscribers a day. So if he's excited about one subscriber, like nor uh, normally you'd, if you're in a channel that's play in that place, you wouldn't get excited about one subscriber. You'd more be like, if you had a good day, like, Hey, we got more subscribers today than usual. You get excited about that. Right. Right. So if he's getting excited about one subscriber, either they're not, it's not a very realistic framing of the space he's in or maybe more generously and give them the benefit of the doubt that this was intentional. It's a channel that stagnated or on the decline, right? Maybe, you know, had 40,000 subscribers and has declined, or it's just, well, it sounds like he just made 35. So he's probably on the incline, but maybe a very slow crawl, very stagnated. So, so it's either not realistic or they're framing him as sort of this aspirational, but stagnant, struggling kind of channel in his niche. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, I think it was intentional. I do because, yeah. you know, having listened to interviews with Jeff Ryan, the director who also plays Bryce, mm -hmm. he, you know, he very much wanted the film to be about, as I understand it, among other things, the friendships and, and the points in life where, you know, you have, where you have to make a choice, you have to move forward. And Bryce moved forward, of course, you know, he moved forward and, and ended up being possessed, although that also started much earlier. But Andrew is is just, or Andy is just stuck. He's stuck. You know, he is still reliving the hurt from when Bryce left and went to Hollywood and got the Thunderman gig because Bryce is a character, is the lead character on a CW show called Thunderman, which I, I certainly hope they make. I would be one CW show I watch. <laughs> and... And he's still, he's still doing prank videos and he's sort of in this permanent adolescence and, and I don't have a screen cap of it, but there's this great, this great moment. And I, again, it's very subtle, but when you, Andy wears a, a ball cap for most of the, the early part of the film where you're getting introduced to everyone. Mm -hmm. And then there's a point where he takes it off and he's, he's bald on top. Yeah. And it's this, this really, I think great reveal because it shows that, yeah, he's not, he's not as young as, as he wants you to think he is. He's not as young as he thinks he is. Mm -hmm. He's still stuck. He's a grown ass man who is by circumstances. I mean, living in your parents' basement, well, shit happens in this economy, but um, still, you know, he's a grown ass man who is still, you know, he's still, he's still playing out my balls. Yeah. You know, that, that is his life. And I, I really, I like that. So I know I, I did think that was intentional. And, and I was saying to you, that was, <clears throat> pardon me. I was saying to you off air, that was something again that, that Ryan mentioned in, in interviews is this is a this film is also a little bit about the the nostalgia of the past and, and how you get stuck in that mm -hmm. because you're not really evaluating it with you know in, in a clear-eyed way. You know, again, Andy has this this memory of ah, these were the great times, you know, before Bryce left, before this. But obviously Andy's the only one really having fun. Mm -hmm. Everyone else is kind of the butt of his jokes. You know, I got to say, if I had a friend whose who's shtick involved dropping a bottle of water on my nuts from 10 feet up, we wouldn't be friends for a real yeah. long time. Because uh, I'm not, I hate pranks. I hate pranks. I'm not good at them. I don't like them. I, the one, I've played one prank in my entire life. Yeah, yeah, there we go. Rin says there's nothing practical about practical jokes. Exactly. Once in my life, my wife was in the shower and she was 
smarting off about something. She's being very funny. And so I said, oh, you'll see. And she goes, oh, what are you going to do? So she's in the shower. I filled a, a pot up with, with uh, ice cubes and cold water. And I tossed it at her feet and I ran. Um, and I, I've never, this is, I don't know, almost 15 years ago now. And I've never lived it down. But it was still a very beautiful moment. Um, <laughs> you know, but uh, but yeah. So I, I think, you know, I definitely believe that was an intentional choice. And Andy's just one of those arrested, kind of arrested adolescents who is trying to, to make his way in a world that, yeah, it's, it's moved on, you know, and, and people are not as into what it is he's doing. Cause I, I think it is mean spirited. And while people do respond to that, I think you have to be able to do it in a very particular way for it to work. Because I do think there is that, that stink of desperation, you know, when you're dealing with, uh, when you're dealing with an internet celebrity or, or someone who does that kind of work because it, it can be mercurial as you know you know if, if you're a tiktok personality if you're a, an instagram personality the inst the the or youtube even the algorithm can fuck you mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden you're back to zero you know th th there was an artist i know uh well i, I i'm sure he won't mind because he put this out in a public email vampire stepdad mm -hmm. massive fan of vampire stepdad wonderful truly he's a nice guy and his music is incredible and YouTube changed their monetization rules a couple of years ago. And as I'm sure you know, they raised the threshold mm -hmm. for what would make a, an account uh, monetizable. Mm -hmm. And he had been getting a nice little check every month from people streaming his music on YouTube. But with the raising of the threshold, he is, it was gone. It was just mm -hmm. out the door. And I, I think, you know, it, it's, it's stressful. I mean, there have been studies about how, I don't know if maybe studies is, is too, is too broad, but there have been reports and articles about how people who do this kind of work exclusively, particularly YouTubers, their burnout rate is incredibly high. Mm. Yeah. And I almost wonder if that was the, the point of the sort of Mobius structure of the film is if this idea that no matter what it is you're doing, you, you're back to one and you got to do it again tomorrow because otherwise the algorithm will forget you. Yeah. No, with, with that kind of content, you know, that, that, you know, unless you're doing evergreen content, like educational content that someone's, you know, whenever they're YouTube, you know, whenever they don't look up how to make French toast, they, they find your video and it's, you know, but if it's, if it's not that kind of content, um, the kind and the kind he does is obviously not that kind. It's, it's much more, um, you know, the, what's, what have you done for me lately in terms of content? There is this pressure to keep doing something more. And what's even worse is you know, the, the pressure is to do something bigger, worse, more extreme. Right. Right. And then, you know, when you look in, there's the, 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 then there are huge YouTube channels that now have budgets, you know, people like Mr. Beast and other content creators like that, that, that are always pushing the envelope. And, you know, and so if you're someone like him, who's seems Andy's characters, a little bit of a, you know, maybe past, past his expiration date is as a content creator needs to be doing something else, probably needs a transition plan for his life. Um, and is just, you know, is trying to trudge along. It's, it's, there's, there's a lot of, I'm, I'm sure kind of mental health, uh, you know, implications for that. Um, and, you know, and you're right, you know, you talked about just the places and he seems very bitter towards Bryce and that, you know, they start him, they start, Andy out as a not very likable character based on the, you know, the pranky content creator he is. And throughout the film, they just keep making him petty and petulant and not likable. It's the, they don't redeem him really ever. In my opinion, um, I, I, maybe you feel bad for him, but you don't like him. If that makes sense. Yeah. I wouldn't say I ever came to like Andy, but I think I, I came to feel for him a little bit because I, mm -hmm. I one of the strengths of the film is that it is very well acted. Mm-hmm. You and I have talked before on here about how there are times on this show when we've watched a film and thought, mm, okay, I understand. You guys probably had 12 days and you all just met each other the moment before you hit, uh, mm -hmm. before, before the first uh, shot started. But this one, I, I thought everyone did a great job. The writing, the writing was good too, as far as these things go. And I thought they did a great job of showing us who these characters are without telling us yeah, who they are. It, it, it felt like you were in a real friend group and you were able to determine everyone's place and to a large degree, the relationships just from the way they related to each other. They really felt like a group of people who knew each other. Yeah. And I, uh, earlier today I watched 
another film that Jeff Ryan made. It was a it was a co uh, co production he, he directed with. Um, I'm afraid I can't remember her name, but it was his directing partner at the time. It's called Mass Hysteria, and it's 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 65 minutes. It's on Shutter. It's it's worth worth your time, and it it feels the same way. He seems to have this knack for having actors comf- making them comfortable with each other, so they can mm. they can produce that feeling of of easy camaraderie. So I think further to that, I think the strength of the of the performance with Andy was I came to understand him, and I I came to mm. see all right, he's kind of a tool. But also, I think there's a lot of hurt there. Yeah. And I think the anger and the stupidity make a great cover for the hurt. Yeah. That makes sense. And again, it, it, that's that's not a thought I often have watching found, independent found footage horror films mm-hmm. where, one, where I wonder about the interior emotional life of a character. That is unusual. <laughs> you know, I, even with stuff I've liked, like in a stranger's house or in a town full of ghosts. I never think, boy, I really feel for that guy and identify with him on an emotional level. That doesn't happen. So I think that yeah. was a major strength of the film. No, that makes sense. Um, there, there was a lot to like. I thought the acting was good. The writing was good. Um, you know, overall, I think for, for being kind of a smaller budget film, I think they did a very good job. I do have a little bit of a critique I'd like to bring uh, about the, kind of just my reaction to the film. I did feel like there were it had a little bit of a difficult time finding its place in some ways. Um, you know, I, I just kept thinking, okay, is it a satire or a parody or a lampoon? Like it didn't quite to me hit any of those notes consistently. It seemed to try to be a little too serious at moments to be a full on kind of parody. Uh, and, it, but it fe- seemed a little too kind of hokey at points. To, I don't know if that's the right word to be a, a, a really strong satire um like there were points that lead heavily into the social media tropes at times but then also try to hit other natural moments and i know there you know i know sometimes doing those kinds of mixed modalities can work but it just didn't for me feel like it was done in a way that worked um you know and then inconsistent use of the camera point of view i don't know it it didn't quite work for me in those regards something about that um you know, they were trying to be a comedy, but also realistic at points. But like, like I felt like the re- reactions to when things started going down weren't quite realistic. It just it felt like there was like there wasn't enough fear and too much of, oh, this is the next adventure for my video. Right. Just it felt like survival mode should have kicked in a little more for Andy because like he's doing the camera stop, shop uh, shot to, you know, the kind of the just talking to the camera by himself and the wizard's like, so I just found out that my friend is a demon and he's just gaming this out like for his video. And he just, I didn't, I didn't sense the kind of fear I would, I would have if I encountered the potential reality with someone I knew literally had a demon. So, and, and yes, listen, maybe it's maybe, anybody. maybe the explanation for that is it's, it's more towards a comedy kind of thing, but it just didn't, to me, something about those notes weren't hit quite consistently enough for it to work for me. And I, I'm not trying to be, you know, mean spirited. Ah, I see what I did there but about the <laughs> film. But this is, a, as you know, all you know, we try to be fair, positive, and the critiques. And this is for me a thing that yeah, didn't yeah. quite hit right for me. Yeah, I would agree with that. And that's something that's come up in reviews of the film. And that's even okay. something Ryan himself has acknowledged in interviews. Is he? Mm. It's meant to be a horror comedy, and that's a okay. that's a difficult line to tread. Mm. it's yeah it's you know it, it's hard to get that right i will say one of the uh one of the films i've seen recently that gets it wrong mm-hmm. so fucking wrong was uh winnie the pooh blood and honey <laughs> i've seen the movie poster but not the film you've seen all you need to joseph okay I so paid it does not good, hit that i paid good money to go see that in the theaters and mm-hmm. uh I looked at it's I've never had 85 minutes take that long okay ever and I've been to funerals of people I've loved that this just yeah. it was brutal and it it tried to be a horror comedy it tried to be because it was brutally violent mm. and there's obviously a couple intended moments of laughter but there's also things that just it just doesn't work in any in yeah. any way and I, I remember watching that movie thinking this guy should have just watched hatchet mm. and not made this movie because it's it's yeah. it just doesn't work. It, that's got that movie's got one joke. What if Winnie the Pooh was a serial killer? And it it bangs that one note flat with a hammer until you are yourself uh, crying for the sweet release of death. 
Um, and listen, Hatchet, Hatchet is, I think, does it very well. It's got mm -hmm. moments of levity, but then there's some really over the top violence and gore. But it, that's also so extreme, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the buckets of blood spraying everywhere that you have to, you can't help but laugh. Yeah. Even a Deadstream, which I think this film mm. sort of suffers from having come out after Deadstream. Right. So soon after Deadstream. I think Deadstream nails that balance mm -hmm. in, a, in a much better way uh, than, than this one does. And again, that, that's something that, that the filmmaker has acknowledged, that it leans more yeah. on the comedy than it does on the horror. Because you're right, there's a moment where a dead body falls from the fucking ceiling. And... The, the first instinct of d the character Dewey, who's a little bit like their, um, what's Dew. his name? Uh, yeah. Or Dew, or Dew, yeah. But he's he reminds me of the, what's Danny McBride. He's yep. their Danny yep. McBride. And he just puts his, he checks its pulse and it's dead. It's a skeleton. And, and I laughed, of course, but there's no conversation about, are we going to take this? Take, are we going to call the police? Are we going to, you know, it's just, oh no, back to, back to the, the mystery machine, yeah. back to, uh, uh, to Bryce's frightening house in the Poconos. And so that, yeah, that, that clanged a little bit. Although yeah. interestingly, something you mentioned about the camera thing, that was something I, I particularly thought was well done because I usually mm. find when watching found footage films at some point, especially independent ones, at some point I find myself thinking, Jesus Christ, I wish, I wish they just hold the camera straight <laughs> or I wish they would put the camera in just somewhere that doesn't suck. Yeah, you know, I, I watched, uh, for, for example, I watched one, I won't say the name, possibly because I can't remember what it was, but, oh no, I remember what it was now. Uh, but they didn't, I don't think they had a cinematographer. They just thought, oh no, we can just have the actors use the camera. And sure you can, but there has to be some kind of thought as to the construction of the shot. Yeah. And they would just put the fucking camera down on a table. Mm. And after the fifth consecutive shot that was just on a table looking at someone's ass while their their heads were completely cropped out of the frame, I thought, no, we're done here. And mm. whereas this film, I thought I, it was so well executed, I didn't really think about the found footage angle, and it never occurred to me to think, why the hell are they still shooting? Yeah. So for for, for me, that actually worked. And, and I mean, I I really liked this shot here. Mm -hmm. I just I love because you know from my Instagram photography, I love angles and yeah. such. And there's just this is a really cool shot and. It's got depth there. Yeah. It's again, I'm, I don't, we're not experts. We're weird, but I like it. And again, rarely in found footage do I find myself going, Oh, Oh, that's actually pretty cool. And I guess yeah. maybe if it's calling attention to itself, that defeats the purpose, but I don't think most people would notice. It's just, I'm a nerd about triangles. So I noticed. So here's what I would have liked to have seen. Cause I think you made some great points and the, the, the switching between the the camera point of view, the, the content creator camera point of view versus the filmmaker point of view, there that could have been used in a way that actually helped that work better, switching your frame of reference. Um, and what I would have liked to have seen them do is actually mess with the aspect ratios. Like when they were going to the 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 their camera point of view, maybe you know, change it to more of a YouTube. And then when the film, I think film aspect ratios are a little wider, if I'm not mistaken. So maybe have the black bars or whatever, but do something when you're going back and forth. And then maybe it'd be a little more intentional about how using those aspect ratios and the, the, the altering right between content creation, filming, and just film us watching the film, you know, as, as, from the filmmaker's point of view. So maybe there's some things that could have been done that with that, that could have tightened up this sort of thing we're talking about. And then, as you said, uh, the filmmaker acknowledged, um, I'm glad you brought up Deadstream because you had mentioned the film, which I hadn't seen, but I watched it in preparation for this. And I agree, like Deadstream hit that note, you know, it was mm. clear what it was from start to finish. Like it didn't try to be too serious. You know what I'm saying? It was funny all yeah. the way through. The The character committed to it, who he was. It was more of a parody, right? It was, but it was very clear what it was. You know, it, it, it didn't suffer from that. You know, there were things about this film, uh, Mean Spirited, that I think were technically better, right? In terms of that you talked about. I love the shot that you talked about. I agree that, you know, the cinematography, um, the acting was good. 
Um, so there were some certain technical things that were executed better in this film, but I think Deadstream did a better job of hitting that note consistently. Yeah, I, I mean, Deadstream, I remember uh, listening to an interview with the directors of that whose names are escaping me, but they also directed the only, uh, I felt, good segment in VHS 99. They, their uh, frame of reference for that one, they, they were going for an Evil Dead, specifically going for an okay. Evil Dead 2 vibe. And th that's sort of an interesting point. I, I, thinking about things Jeff, um, I've forgotten his name already. I believe it's Jeff. Uh, his, what's his last name? Jeff Ryan. Anyways, Ryan, thank you. Yeah. That that Jeff Ryan has said in, in interviews is that I think because Deadstream had something to sh to sort of point towards. Mm -hmm. You know, we're making this movie. We're making Evil Dead Two, the found footage, mm -hmm. the found footage douchebaggy version. And, and again, love the movie. It works. Mm -hmm. It gives you something very, some very clear beats to follow. Yeah. Where and consequently, I think those filmmakers are, you know, they're they're on their way up. Mm -hmm. Whereas with Jeff Ryan's movies, especially with with Mean Spirited, I think it's a little more amorphous. He's making mm -hmm. something a little more original in that space, and and of course, it, you know, you can argue how well it works, but I do think it tries to be less one thing. It's not trying to be Evil Dead Two. It's not trying to be this. It's it's being Mean Spirited, and yeah. That, I mean, I respect that. It's one of the reasons I, I picked the movie, but if that can be a hard sell. I, and I mean, I struggle with that with, with Ghost Story, guys, you know, because there are shows which are really super cool and they do, you know, I'm telling a ghost story and mm -hmm. I believe everything I'm saying and here's the next ghost story. And they do very well and they're good shows. Mm -hmm. Whereas our show is a little more loosey-goosey, you know, here's a ghost story, here's a frank talk from your two favorite uncles about, you know, the, the inevitability of death. Here's yeah. another ghost story. And you find an audience, but it's you're not necessarily going to get the massive audience that uh, that this guy might. Yeah, and and I think that's yeah that that does work against mean spirited. I, again, I also I believe Deadstream is just uh, better executed, but yeah, I think having something to sort of pattern yourself after makes it a little easier to do that. Which is not to say it was easy to make the film because. Having listened to interviews with with the directors, it was not an easy film to make. But I, there's I think another that helps. Sorry, there's another right. film that we we discussed a while back that I think it's a different different topic, but I feel like this other film we looked at hit the tone right, and that was the Vice Guide to Bigfoot or Fifteen Things, the Bigfoot one we did. Oh because yeah, it yeah, did. Yeah. It, it had some of these elements of yep. the documentary footage, but also the serious stuff. And I it's, listen. I don't have the vocabulary to explain how or why, but that film hit the notes that this one was trying to hit, and 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 the mixed modalities, and what it was that was different. I'm not sure, but it reminded me of that, but missing, not hitting it quite the way that film did. Yeah, I mean, Vice Guide to Bigfoot had, or it was also called Fifteen, 15 Things, things Didn't Know About yeah. Bigfoot, but we're afraid to ask. Yeah. Number or one number one, one will nine. surprise you or something like that. Yeah. It had 12 different names. It really did. Yeah. That, yeah. that didn't help it as I recall. Yeah. But I, I think that also benefited from, that also was a template because mm -hmm. they were, they were lampooning vice documentaries. Yeah. Yeah. So they had a very clear format and, and I, they also, I believe had an editor who had done work with vice. That's right. One of the, he was, I don't know if he was the producer or someone who was, I remember when we walked, we talked about this one, that was something that was brought up. Yeah. Yeah. And whereas you know, Ryan, he, he, I believe, as I recall, he edited this film. He's his own editor, yeah. okay. which is, you know, that's not a knock against him at no. all, but yeah. it's when you're the writer, director, star, uh, and editor, you know, these things, they, they pile up and it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's very difficult to be great at everything, especially yeah. at, at the indie level, right? Because the, it, it's one thing if you're, I'm trying to think of someone who edited their own movies. I mean, I can't think about the top of my head, but if even if you are a, a multi hyphenate at say the studio level, you've got a lot more time and money to work with. Yeah, yeah. Whereas you know, I mean, I, Ryan apparently just him and his wife just had their first kid. I believe wow. it was their first yeah. kid. So that's you're trying to do all this shit on top of all that, which is of course you know that's that's not an excuse, but I I think it it, it affects that. So yeah, but but the the one thing I will say about Vice Guide is it never tried, I shouldn't say never, it spent a lot less time trying to hit the horror notes. Yeah, yeah. 
Vice Guide, it didn't really hit the horror notes until the last mm, 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I mean, I guess it, it it did a little bit of that, that crime, a little more hard edged crime thing. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but yeah, anyway, so, so I, I agree with you. It, it did it better. Although mm -hmm. I did, again, it, it had the benefit of, of having a, a template to follow. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think what it, it had the template to follow for the, that side, but the comedy side that it spliced with that was, is not part of the vice thing. So it had, so, so some, its ability to merge those was, was very deft and, and, and dexterous in my opinion. But, um, but listen, oh, yeah. you know. I, I think that's easily the funniest movie we've done with yeah, Vice Guys yeah. Bigfoot. I think the best yeah. movie we've done so far was Saloom. Yes. And I think the funniest movie we've done was Vice Guide to Bigfoot. Absolutely. I've got just one last point I want to bring up. Um, it's sure. something completely different. Um, and this is sort of a substantive content of it. You know, one of the themes that things that I was thought was interesting, I think you're going to know where I'm going with this was, you know, the blacking out of the eyes. And I wonder how much that was influenced by the urban legend of the black eyed children, which I know you find to be an interesting one. Um, sure. You know, the, this, this urban legend that started uh, as, as I, understand from someone in Abilene, Texas, who claimed to have encounters with uh, dark eyed, pale skinned children that, you know, supposedly want to be invited into your home or, or something. And, you know, there's a lot of different, you know, narratives about these. Um, so I, I thought that was, when I saw those, uh, those black and eyes, that was immediately what came to mind. So I'm wondering how much it was influenced by it or if it was just a coincidence. So I, I just thought that was an interesting thing. And I know you have interest in that particular, uh, cryptid as we would call it maybe yeah i mean he, that definitely started yeah, that was abilene texas the the fellow who first reported it he was a journalist named brian bethel mm. and as i recall there is some debate about this certainly i think there's a lot of bullshit stories which have come up after that as with so many of these things one person has an experience which could very well be valid and then a million people kind of jump on the bandwagon and then it becomes a reddit thing and there's whole creepy pastas devoted it it gets, it gets gets very annoying but so if that could be it could be that it, it pardon me that could be inspired by black eyed kids it could also just be that it was a relatively cheap cgi effect to accomplish yeah 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 that's but, that's also possible too i know one the one paranormal thing i found associated with the film because of course for listeners who don't know, I the show on my day to day show, as I mentioned, Ghost Story Guys, we tell stories of the paranormal. That is, uh, after I believe, uh, Jeff, Jeff Ryan said on a certain after shooting certain kind of spooky evil scenes, they did briefly notice there was dead birds laying around, the smell mm -hmm. of sulfur in the shower, and one or two other things, but it didn't, it didn't last. There was something happened, and then it just kind of it was all done. So again, it could be absolutely nothing, yeah. but I will say that house was creepy as hell. <laughs> that house he was living in. I don't know if that was an Airbnb or if someone owned that house, but good Lord, I, something about it was deeply discomforting. You're not a fan of the uh, mid century modern kind of architecture. Is that what that was? It, I, it, I mean, I'm not an expert, but that's what it seemed a little bit like. And if someone knows better, please do correct me. But I, that just, that looked like the Airbnb it from Patrick Bateman. It was not, <laughs> no, I mean, Bryce with his terrifying abs, how I hate him. Uh, you know, he very much had a Patrick Bateman vibe, Yeah, but, yeah. uh, yeah, I, that, that house did not do it for me. And I got to say, I, I like Jeff Ryan. I like his presence. And in a, in a just world, he would be getting those Ezra Miller roles mm. because we don't need any more Ezra Miller. <laughs> So Joseph, that is a, it's a quick talk to go on this time. Any other points before we, before we head out? No, I think that's everything I had. It was, you know, I enjoyed the movie. It was, it was, uh, again, having a background in content creation, I, that was an interesting, you know, thing for me in this film. And, you know, despite, you know, a few critiques here and there, but overall, uh, you know, it was a fun movie. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I feel the same way. I, I liked what it had to say. I thought it, it got its point across. It did it effectively. It was it was concise. It, it I felt it, it again it, after it transitioned out of the the YouTube lampooning stuff. I thought it slowed down a little bit, mm -hmm. but it's rare I watch a horror movie and give a shit about the characters. And uh, I actually cared about these ones. And when you know people died who died, 
yeah, it was it was a bummer. And one relationship that really jumped out at me was the relationship between Tom, Andy's videographer, and his girlfriend Nikki. Mm-hmm. This this idea that she is she's clearly far more successful than he is. Mm-hmm. She's much more better dressed. She's you know she's an adult, and Tom seems very much like a, a like an arrested adolescent, kind of like Andy. Mm-hmm. And she about says as much when uh, I believe it's Joey is recording her talking to Andy after they leave the visitor center. And she says, well, my sister is married. Her husband's a doctor or whatever like that, whatever that, but I just want to have some fun. And mm-hmm. so she, she's, she knows where she's going. She knows which this is just a stop on the way. And we've all met people like that. And mm-hmm. we've all met guys in relationships like that who just, you know, they're, they're just, uh, they're just along for the ride. And quite often they don't realize that their partner's <laughs> headed places. Uh, but everyone else around them does. And yeah, I enjoyed that. Yeah. So, all right. Well, before we go, there's one thing that uh, we do when we have something to recommend. And that is called the boost. All right. So just a quick boost this time. I, I watched this one a little while ago. I just forgot to mention it. It sure is not fucking hell Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey. <laughs> I don't have a graphic for it, but it is Brad Rigo's Cryptid. It came out in 2022. And it, uh, according to IMDb, the story, which I will read here once everything moves, my internet's very slow. A small rural town in Maine, written, Maine, is shocked as a mysterious animal leaves a local resident brutally ripped apart. Deemed to, to be a random bear attack by town officials, freelance journalist Max Frome suspects it might be something more. And it works out really well that I'm recommending this on the same stream as Mean Spirited because it, it's similar in that you actually care about the characters. It takes time to let you get to know these people before it puts them in peril. And there was one character death, which I won't spoil, but there is a character death that occurs during the film. I was really surprised and I was actually upset about it because I quite mm-hmm. liked that character. And so, yeah, again, the film is called Cryptid. It's directed by Brad Rigo, R-E-G-O. You can find that streaming on, well, you have to rent it, but you can find it. might By this point, it might be on Tubi. But otherwise, you can rent it on Google Play, all those platforms. And the same thing with Mean Spirited. You can, you can rent it pretty much anywhere you rent your movies. It may turn up on Shutter at some point, but it's five bucks out of your pocket. And as we've said on this show many, many times, every dollar you spend on independent film is a vote for more independent film. Don't pirate independent films. You want to pirate shit if you have to, which we don't recommend. You know, stuff like Endgame. Ant-Man 3. Don't pay for Ant-Man 3 like I did. Don't be that guy. (laughs) I regretted it. It, Don't even pirate Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey. As much as it pains me to say that, and I don't think you should spend money on it, if you have to see it, pay for it god help us you'll pay <laughs> but yeah so my recommendation this time around is cryptid directed by brad rigo again 2022 you can rent it anywhere you can rent mean spirited anywhere and we recommend that you do that joseph any final thoughts uh nope just enjoyed uh, talking about this one it was it was a fun film to watch i'm looking forward to our next adventure yes so the audio version of this show will be going up probably in a couple days and then the next show will be audio only uh, with much better sound quality, I might add. It's mm-hmm. not as echoey. Uh, that will be, oh, the name just went out of my head. Brad something, I think. But it, the film's called The Outwaters. And that is another apparently experimental horror film. You can see that, uh, again, rent it anywhere. It's in select theaters. I don't know where. There's not many of them. It's, I think even fewer than Skin Rink. But it, we will be talking about that. So looking forward, Joseph, as always. When, or pardon me, where can people find John? Oh, you know what? Before we do that, I just remembered I have to mention music. Yeah. Yes. So all our music has been created by The Revenants. Our opening theme is Rest in Peace from the album Music from Big Beige. And I, the other pieces I don't remember. But everything music-wise in this film, or pardon me, in this show, is created by The Revenants, which of course is the project of Elliot Wilder. And you can find The Revenants streaming everywhere you get your music and more information about them at nightharvestrecordings.com. There we go. Now, Joseph, where can everyone find you online? You can find me on Twitter at J-O-K-O-M-O-13, Jokomo13, uh, or on YouTube. If you're into NFL football, check out the Cardinal Rule. 
Uh, and obviously here at Weird Together. Yes. I'm on Twitter and Instagram as Largely the Truth. As I mentioned, I host the Ghost Story Guys podcast with Paul Bestel of Mysteries and Monsters. And you can find my other shows, Book of the Dead, Transmissions from the Void, everywhere. You get your podcasts and you can find me at ghoststoryguys.com. And I guess that's going to do it. Well, Joseph, until next time, or not Joseph, well, folks, <laughs> until next time, remember, we're weird. And you're weird. So why not be weird together? Where are we going here? See you next time. Let me ride.